Um, yes, I, I'll reiterate, I guess, what we've heard a little bit from um, both Simon and Fiona. It's, it's not just um, one technique uh, in one area. It, it's about picking, optimising what you want, and it's, it's, it's about horses for courses. So I'll be focusing on the, the really fine fractions in soils because that's what I've spent quite a bit of time doing in the last couple of years. But I do want to emphasise that, you know, there are settings where, you know, really coarse materials, so we're talking about the lateritic pisoliths just a minute ago in the last presentation. Bronze wing, it was a great setting for that sort of greater than two millimetre sampling media. And it's about knowing your site. And even in the example there where I've got the downhole plots, you see, you know, if you're looking for lead, you're going to get much greater concentrations in those really fine materials. And this is in the Kalahari. But, you know, if you're targeting copper deposits, well, probably doesn't really matter which size fraction you use in that case. So it's about doing that orientation early on and getting a feel for what will work well. In the same um, vein, uh, Nick Oliver uses this one to sort of say, what sort of, what sort of techniques should we be pairing up or sample media? And um, he does this around uh, different extractions, but I've just put in here Mr. Bean with the Mini as like being a, a pretty generic, we've just sort of taken 250 mesh or micron, 80 mesh, and just gone with it, uh, and you, you're not going to get the good results, whereas the really, the, the really nice-looking, slick um, results, maybe your George Clooney and your Corvette, that's sort of what the standard is for a lot of people. And you can mix those up, and that's where you get into more trouble, because um, you, know, you can pick a really good size fraction that might work, but if you don't put the analytical package with it, then you're going to be um, operating pretty poorly. Uh, likewise, you can have a really good analytical package, but not pick your right material. And while you get something that sort of works, it just doesn't quite look as slick. Um, George there doesn't, doesn't quite cut it like he did in his, in his um, Corvette. And I'll come back now, I'll come back to those, uh, those images later on through the talk, but um, why is the fine fraction uh, a, a good fraction to use? Well, I think um, some of the work Ravi uh, Anand and myself and a couple others did as part of the Amara P778 projects early on, we buried ore in sand dunes, transported dunes, and we looked at, um, within about seven months, we were able to surface the sample uh, and pick up subtle gold um, anomalies over the uh, gold ore, the buried gold ore, and likewise, we picked up copper and zinc above the buried VMS ore in those materials. So what, what's happening is those things are moving, and they're likely to be fine, they're likely to be mobile, so they weren't, there were seasonal effects in those areas. So if you're working through you know, transported cover, then probably the fine material is what's going to really be the, the material that binds that up because it has a good surface area and that's what it's all about is capturing these, these mobile elements in those zones. So when you look at the, just the diameter of the particles and the surface exchange area, you can see really quickly that the, the clays have a vast surface area and we all sort of know this intuitively. We probably just haven't spent as much time focusing on why we might want to use that finer fraction. And so here's some examples from um, sand dunes where most of the gold was hosted in those clays and a little bit in the silts as well. But very, you're almost diluting your signature if you're just going with the, the coarse quartz materials. Uh, and I'll show an example where it's more, much more reproducible and reliable. And this is an example I really like. It's not, there we go. Um, this was work that Dennis Arne, who's here today, published um, uh, in Explore, but it goes back to work in the Yukon Geological Survey in 2003 where they did stream sediment analysis. Um, but the re this is the reproducibility of that data. So when you look at those duplicate analysis, the whole thing's really a waste of time because you don't have any confidence in that data. And Simon sort of alluded to this as well with the, with the reproducibility in some of those plant samples. If you pick the wrong sample, um, you get into this zone where you have you know a, a nearly PPM anomaly, and you follow that up and you get below detection. Well, you just have absolutely no confidence in that data, so you walk away. Um, and this, this area really didn't open up for about another five years when a different soil sampling technique was used in there, that region. That's the white gold region in the Yukon. So survey's work was really not, not well utilised because of the technique. And then Dennis and Bill McFarlane came through and took, some, took similar samples or the same samples and used a clay size fraction or a, this is, I think, a less than four micron in this case. Sorry to interrupt. We've just got uh, some trucks trying to get in. We've got two cars blocking the driveway. A blue BMW 1G0X598 and a white Subaru 191B349. Can you please move your cars straight away? Sorry. All right. No, that's all right. Um, I'll get back on course. Uh, so, yeah, anyway, reproducing the, 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 those same samples with a fine fraction or a clay size fraction, uh, you get a lot more confidence and you can see straight away in that data, you know, you may not be chasing your 800 ppb gold anomaly, but you're confident in your 42 ppb anomaly that you can reproduce it. 
And now I'll switch to what I've been working on really, which has been WA focused soils, and that's an ultrafines uh, project, and we were funded. Uh, it's just wrapped up, so it's all publicly available. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on um, a lot of the bits and pieces in there. It's in a MRIWA report, it's in a CSIRO report, it will be badged in a GSWA report in the next couple of months, I think, or maybe even sooner. If you want it, just email me or get online, you can grab it. Uh, really, the, the overall things that were in that report, it's a lot of boring method development that we needed to do because it wasn't sort of done. It was like, what, how do you separate that? What sort of... Um, uh, aggregation or dispersants and, and methods do you need to use and so we did that sort of work and the real key findings were you know one you can increase your concentrations of most of your metals of interest by about 150 to 250 percent consistently um, it wasn't as high as some of the early work we did where we got even bigger recoveries but that's pretty consistent now um, and the big thing was we improved ge the geological surveys data in terms of censored data from some of their work from 67% of samples that were below detection for gold, we're down to 10% now when we reassayed those soils. And I think the biggest thing that came out of it was that we were able to develop a workflow that not only just did your standard geochem, but it also added in things like spectral mineralogy, um, specific surface areas of your soils, uh, particle size, a range of different things that you now get as part of that, um, that package. So you don't just get um, your George Clooney Corvette, which is, which is great. It, it works well. Your, 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 full, your full, um, digestion and analysis, you get a full suite of elements. I like that everyone's talking multi-elements up here today. And I think that's, that's, that's a standard nowadays, but what we've developed is what we're calling the ultra fine plus. Um, it's a, a registered trademark, but that, that workflow is, is the exact same. You're getting that, that, that same package of elemental data, but on top of that, and why wouldn't you? get your um, DiCaprio in his, his slick car as well, and this is where you've got pH conductivity data being reported. And as well as that, there's something a little bit less common, but this is your, your Bieber and his Lamborghini, and it's the spectral mineralogy that we're getting with this. And it's, it's sort of the stuff that we don't really quite get. Uh, I think my generation and above probably don't understand Justin Bieber much at all. But it's the sort of material and information and data that we will be the next generation will be using. So we won't just use our geochemistry, we'll be using spectral min mineralogy, we'll be merging it, and we'll be making our decisions based on that. So, so my, I'm encouraging people to, to demand that, that you get that extra information. Whether it's the Ultrafine Plus method or another one, uh, that's the sort of stuff we should be getting uh, routinely. And there's a, there's a range of other pr uh, parameters that go in, so just more data really, and more information. And so this is some of the results at the start. This is where our um, test, uh, I guess, cases across WA where we picked uh, key samples and it wasn't just mineralized samples, it was the background areas that we had um, other samples from, um, previous work. Uh, there's Tropicana, there's Boddington, there's Antipas sites up in the Patterson. There's a range of different scenarios. And we looked at the, the distribution of the particle size and then you look at the, this is gold in this case, but um, a lot of the other metals are quite similar. And you see the black, which is that fine clay fraction, hardly reports, but then there's a lot of the actual gold is in that proportion. I've focused on gold because that's where the biggest benefits are, particularly with the, the nugget effects. But copper and zinc and things like that work very well as well. Uh, this is the de Grusa site, uh, one of the ones we had an orientation uh, samples available, so we ran them over the top. And you can see that it pretty, pretty effectively picks out the mineralization there. The uh, orange and green little uh, polygons are the, the supergene dispersion of the copper and gold. Um, and it's fairly thin cover, two metres over the top of that and trending into about 10 metres in, in those lines. And you can see the, the uh, concentrations in the fine fraction, which is the blue or the ultra fine. You can see both the copper and gold uh, have greater concentrations. But to be honest, in, in this setting, the, uh, those bulk or coarser size fractions worked quite well as well. What I've been seeing lately, though, is some of the, the data that um, companies are, are doing work in and I'm not involved in is where they've had almost no responses. And so these, uh, these three traverses across there are from an area where there was one sample out of all, the, the, they're three different depths. One sample came back with a bleg result that had a little bit of gold in it, nothing else. Um, and then a range of other techniques, hydroxylamine, hydrochloride, a number of partial extractions, didn't give anything really. There was one plant sample that gave a response to. And then this, is, this was completely randomised data and when you put it back in, in sequence you see that you get a nice consistent uh, gold anomaly to that uh, right hand side and it shows up in a number of different depths. So some confidence that you can get some good reproducible data. Uh, on the left is the Mitel profile and this was a site where 
a lot of us spent a, a lot of time working, trying to find anything at the surface that would predict the nickel down below. Um, and it wasn't until we did the profiles and we sort of found that there's an interface at about 30 centimetres that has that little bit of elevated nickel response. Um, when we went back and did the same profile with the fine fractions, uh, we get that result all the way down through that like upper uh, 30 or 40 centimetres with the, the ultrafine technique. And now just shows some of the results in a regional context. And this is where I think there's, there's quite a lot of power for future project generation and future work for the surveys as well. In terms of, um, we went to the historic GSWA samples uh, and we picked areas of known gold mineralisation. Most of you, I suspect, in this room really uh, recognise this map. So Agnew Lawlers, you've got the Yandel Greenstone Belt there. And this is, on the left, is the GSWA data that was historically reported. I've taken out the stream sediment samples in that region. So we filtered on um, being away from the stream sediments uh, and you can see that there's not that many numbers that show up. The ones that do pick out the, the areas that you'd probably be most interested in, but quite a few areas get, get missed and the bronze wing area is one. Uh, we took those exact same samples. We went back to the core shed, pulled them out of the, the archives and, and assayed them and you can see that the whole area is um, standing out pretty strongly. But what we did that was more as a demonstration for what you could do. We then went to the Kingston area map sheet where GSWA had published this work in 2000 um, and that, that top result is their, their set for that, um, that region. There's, there's 13 or 18 samples that reported any gold in that region. You're stepping off into the northeast Yulgarn margins there, into the Erahiti Basin and they, they use the standard George Clooney, maybe the, the minus 180 wasn't probably the best fraction but you can see it's, it's pretty standard stuff that's out there in the... In, in the world, as most people, many people would have used. Um, and then we applied the, uh, the Ultrafine Plus method to that. And you see that we've got, um, you know, a whole lot more data and information there. Whether that's picking up mineralisation, we have no idea. But, you know, you're, all of a sudden you're getting a lot more information you can work with when you go into these regions. And so, Phil Baker, who I'm not sure is in the room today, but he, he presented this and it sort of talks about how many samples are actually out there. Um, just in the public data, there's over 10 million samples um, globally that you can just get access to. And you, know, you can see already with the data sets that have been presented in, in private industry, uh, there's, there's core sheds and sheds and sheds of samples that could easily be reassayed to generate whole new targets. And I think there's some real power in that. I think it's kind of the tip of the iceberg in, in terms of what we could do with, um, with geochemistry. And so what I'd, I'd like to see in terms of future development, um, I think we, we, we need to develop um, more additional data sets and integrate them better. And I'll talk about that a little bit in my, my presentation this afternoon. But I think that's going to be really critical is integrating um, those different data. And that's, you know, the machine learning and some of this stuff that we're seeing. We're going to be able to do that much more effectively going forward and much more confidently too. That's the other thing. Um, and this Ultrafine Plus method, which is currently um, available at Lab West, uh, they've set up a, a special... Uh, lab just to do that, but we're hoping that other labs will get on board and, and offer this out to, to multiple, um, to, to their clients as well. But what we're going to do is not just generate that, those, those standard spreadsheets of data, but you'll also have the option in the future to start clicking for additional interpretation where, you know, we can use cloud-based computing and, and merge data sets, produce some of these machine learning models and, and give you um, additional parameters to investigate in your soil surveys. And some of that will take into effect a lot of that spatial data, like the regolith maps, the geophysics that's already out there, you'll be able to integrate that into your, into your soil surveys just when you submit your samples as you standardly would. Um, I'd like, uh, we're looking to generate a new project with this, so the next phase of this we're looking to broaden outside, still, still will be WA focus mostly, but we're looking at other settings, so black soil plains in Queensland are, are on my radar, um, some of the till environments in North America, for instance, or other areas that we really need to test this a bit more. Um, and we want to add a couple of other key parameters um, that we, we think will add a lot more understanding into our soil surveys. And in particular, it will do things like get rid of uh, these false positives. I think we'll get a lot more understanding of those and explaining why they come up um, quite often. And I hope this, this method and other techniques will do that through getting additional data. So I'm saying, you know, get your standard geochemistry, but but ask for spectral mineralogy, ask for these other parameters that they're really pretty cheap and not a big add-on. Um, just, for, just for interest, the Ultrafine Plus is about $60 to $65 a sample. I mean, your standard geochem is, you know, $45, $40. You know, so you're not adding a huge cost to do all this extra data. If you submit your samples for another 4 acid digest and ask for spectral mineralogy, you should be getting it for not more than a few extra dollars um, per sample. 
So I really would implore the, um, the community to demand that as they go forward. Um, and that's it. Thank you.